Well, this is the fourth part of a series that we have been doing that is called The Beginner's Guide to Predicting Your Future. And uh, what a better way to kick off the year and to ask the question, what can we do differently in 2019 that will help us to actually achieve the goals that we want to achieve uh, for this year? And so this whole series uh, is all about how we can predict our own future. And uh, without getting weird or space or time travel, uh, what we mean by that is that all of us at some point have either said of ourselves, to ourselves, or said of or to someone else, you should have seen that coming. Or I should have seen that coming. Almost as if, like, talking about you now, I could see where that decision you were making was headed. You should have seen what I saw. And because of that perspective, and because of of, of that experience, a lot of times, and of course, those of us uh, who who have got parents still, or those of us who are in school, it annoys us to death, but it's true. A parent's perspective experience allows them to very often see where our path is is heading. And so what we've been asking the question uh, of this entire series is, is what can we do to affect that and, and how can we uh, change the direction to have more favorable outcomes in our life? So this is week four, the final uh, installment in this series. And I'm just really trusting my, my heart and my prayer for all of you. It doesn't matter where you are in terms of your relationship with God. Maybe you're here and you're seeking or you're skeptical or someone just dragged you here or tricked you into coming, we're glad you're here too, uh, however you got here. Maybe you were raised in church or weren't raised in church. Maybe you're Christian parents, but you never really found it for, to work for yourself. Wherever you are, my prayer in this entire series is that God would do something in your life uh, that wouldn't just affect you in a moment, like you'd feel something, but actually would affect your feet, your direction, um, so that you can live out what God's called you to live out, which I believe is your extraordinary purpose. So, to get jump into week four, here's something, as I kick off this message, that we all have in common. Here's something I know about you without necessarily knowing all of you. And that is this. Very often, our worst decisions were fueled by something, watch this, with strong emotional appeal. Today's message is called Appealing is Revealing. Okay, I want to talk to you about strong emotional appeal. Appeal. Would you say those three words with me? One, two, three. Strong emotional appeal. That was terrible. That was pathetic. Come on, people. You're alive. It's church. Let's go. One, two, three. Strong emotional appeal. There we go. All of us, in various ways, shapes, and forms, a lot of our worst decisions were fueled by strong things with strong emotional appeal. What do I, what do I mean by that? Well, think about it for a second. I mean, there was a time where this thing, this person, this item, this product, this service, this place, it was appealing to you. It just did something. It tickled your fancy, stirred you up. It just, it turned you on to use certain terms. And so what did you do? You bought it. You leased it. You invested in it. You dated it. You married it. And you moved in with it. There's a time in your life where strong emotional appeal led you to make some decisions. And sometimes, not about the person you you live with and are married to, but sometimes our worst decisions can come about because of strong emotional appeal. I'll give you an example. Um, I don't shop a lot, okay? Shopping's not my thing. I'm very pragmatic when it comes to shopping. I'm like probably most guys. When I need to go shopping, it's because I need to find a pair of jeans Two or three teachers that match those jeans and perhaps another, you know, sock or something else. And so I have a mission. You with me? Come on, guys. Where you at? And so I walk into that shop and it's like, bang, 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 bang. Done. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't try. I try stuff on at home. You know what I'm saying? I look at it. "Mm, Yeah, okay. Grab it. Doesn't fit. I go back and I know. Then I know it's a size less or a size more. There is none of this kind of trying on and, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, how does this look? And. Whatever, that's just not how I roll. My wife, on the other hand, and of course she's not here today, so I gotta talk about her. My goodness, like every time she goes shopping, it's like she's set out on an adventure. It's like it's like her life is a movie and there's a camera watching her just work through this shop, and it's like she looks at every single piece of clothing under it, which by the way, I have no problem with. Personally, no problem. Just don't bring me with you. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, like I am dying. Like I can take a lot of stuff, but when it comes to shopping, man few times it's been pretty close well one time 
in this, you know, kind of rushing of shopping, I bought a shirt, okay? And uh, I was saving for a special occasion. I bought a couple of items. And then the special occasion came about. And then to my shock and my horror, as I pulled this shirt out of the wardrobe, I realized that it was the ugliest damn shirt you'd ever seen in your whole life. It was horrible. Okay? Now, here's a dilemma, because here's what you don't know about me. I'm one of those guys that if it's on the plate, you eat all of it. You with me? It doesn't matter if you're full. If, it's on your, if, you, if, you, if you plated it, you're eating it. No waste. Nothing goes to waste. If you bought it, you use it. You know what I'm saying? If, if you chose it, you wear it. So now I'm in this dilemma of like, I, I can't go out like I'm preaching that because they already laugh at me. It's going to give them more fuel for the fires. You know what I'm saying? But I can't not wear it because I, I can't waste money. It's just not who I am. So what do I do? I mean, it was so appealing in the moment. It, was, it seemed like the right choice, but all of a sudden, here I am, regretting the decision. Of course, I did what all good, noble, you know, what you'd expect of a pastor. I gave someone as a gift. And one of you could be wearing it right now. You don't even know. But the truth is, beside buying clothes, is something happens. We, this thing is strong emotional appeal, but sooner or later, something happens. What happens? It loses its appeal. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. It loses its pizzazz. It loses its effect to, to, to make us wonder and make us appreciate. Now it, he, she, they're gone. Perhaps what began as appealing became a prison or an addiction. You know, let's not do that one again, some of you may be thinking. But how? I mean, so many times uh, we, we ask ourselves the question, how did I get into this place? How did I find myself in this place? How did I make this mistake again? Well, you should have seen that coming. The whole premise of our series is a principle. Uh, the principle of the path. And a principle is not something you choose to apply. It applies itself to you whether you like it or not. You can say, I don't agree with the principle of gravity. Whether you like it or not, gravity applies to you. With me? Um, and, and what we can do is we can choose to ignore this to our own peril or we can choose to leverage this principle for our benefit. What is the principle of the path? The principle of the path is that direction determines, come on, direction determines. Now, in week two, we added in a word, didn't we? Because so many of us, we fall into the trap of our instant gratification Hollywood culture that just because I intend or just because I desire or just because I'm a good person, that somehow, somehow, even though I go that way, I'm going to end up in this place. And what we learn is that, that what, what doesn't work for driving, we assume will work for our lives. And that is, if I'm going to head uh, for Dublin, I need to get off the M6 and stop driving towards Galway. Do you know what I'm saying? If I keep going west, eventually I'm going to meet the Atlantic Ocean. You know what I'm saying? There's no, I can't get to Dublin going west. I got to go east. I got to head towards, I got to get on the M3, head down towards Dublin. But so many of us, we know to be true intuitively about driving or study or academia or even job choice. But do we know to be true of our own lives? Why? Because direction, not intention, determines our destination. In other words, the best way for you to predict your future is to pay attention to where you're headed. You with me? You'll always end up where the path you are on takes you regardless of your intention. And of course, that word is so key. Yesterday, uh, we were coming back from Dublin, like I said, the conference, and because uh, I know my wife and I know her sense of direction is creative, um, uh, we left where we were going. She was behind me. She missed the traffic lights, so and now we're separated. So, of course, I know they never was going to happen. She's going to get lost. So I, I kind of uh, found her on this app that we have, and I can see this. I mean, I'm heading, I'm heading like northeast, which if you don't know where Navin is in relation to Dublin, it's northeast. <laughs> so I'm kind of heading up, uh, you know, up towards Cabra, trying to get towards Blanchardstown, and she's heading east towards Wales. <laughs> right? And so I try to call her, but she's so, so frazzled with the Google Maps thing in her phone, she won't answer the call. She's hanging up on me. This is a metaphor for life, people. We see where you're going, and we're trying to say, hey, don't go that way. But you're so busy and so good. Beep, reject that call. Beep, reject that call. All of a sudden, you crash in the ocean. You go, hey, where were you? I was trying to call you, man. So being the loving husband that I am, I set out after her in pursuit of her. So I'm trying to find out where she is to lead her back home, be the amazing husband that I promised I would be most of the time. And uh, just be truthful. 
but of course, she got, I, I couldn't find her. She ends up going to the port tunnel. I ended up getting stuck in traffic, and I arrived at home and half an hour later than she did. It's a lesson in there somewhere for somebody. Just saying. Just saying. Go, Lud. Thank you. Love that. Direction determines destination. There's often a disconnect between our tensions and directions. And what we said is that relationships are dynamic. In other words, we've got to be careful, especially for those of you today who are single, looking for someone, maybe dating someone, maybe you're young, maybe you've got aspirations wanting to be married. Understand that relationships are not a set destination. They are dynamic. Okay? The person you tether yourself to is not a moor, it's another boat. It's moving in a direction. And if we're not careful, what happens is we tether ourselves to certain people prematurely, and we start moving this way, and they start moving that way, and eventually the thing that, that connects us has to give way, and eventually what was once a unit is now two individuals living separately. with me here, people? Come on. Relationships are dynamic. They're always moving. Relationships are always headed in a direction. That's why, you know, as parents, or maybe you're here and you're young and you have parents, why, why parents always react to kids to the where they're headed. Why? Because parents have this instinctual knowledge from their own experience of if you make this choice, hang around with this person, give yourself to these things and cross those boundaries, watch this, those decisions aren't just decisions, they are directions. And they will lead you to a place where you don't want to be, with people you don't want to be do- with, doing things you want to do, and definitely not in the place you want it to end up. And that's why we, you know, sometimes we have to give our parents some credit because experience does very oftentimes, not all the time, very oftentimes grant perspective. Now, today as we kind of, you know, kind of get into this message, what I want to say is that very often as we think about direction and life and destination, the path that we should avoid, so we think about being the right road, they want to talk about the wrong roads a little bit, I want to say it's the path that should be avoided is always the one that is paved with strong emotional appeal. Come on, one, two, three. Strong emotional appeal. We're driving this home. The path to be avoided is the one with strong emotional appeal. I'm not saying a strong emotional appeal is bad per se. What I am saying is that we got to be very, very careful at the decisions that we make, which will become directions, aren't just made because something is appealing, or because it's aligned to the direction that we want to be in, whether it's financially, whether it's relationally, where it comes to faith, whatever it may be. Our culture uh, is a sucker for strong emotional appeal. I mean, multi-billion euro companies, get this, are multi-billion euro companies because we are suckers when it comes to branding and product placement and um, and the promise that, that, uh, that are made to us as consumers. This even affects church. Recently, I was chatting to someone, and they were saying that they really felt called to go to a church. And I said, well, on what basis do you feel called to go to that church? And they said, well, when I wake up in the morning, I see their post on Instagram. At lunchtime, I see another post on Instagram. And in the evening, I see it again. I feel like God is saying to me, I should go to that church. Now, I'm sitting there keeping a straight face because I actually coach the pastor of that church and we help them with their social media campaign and they strategically post their posts during breakfast, during lunch, and after dinner. Why? Because that's when most people are doing what? Scrolling through Instagram. Unless they're doing it during their job, which is not good, especially if you're a Christ follower. And even in terms of that, even something good and godly, like finding the church, still it's just, it's just product, it's just putting something out there at a strategic time with a strategic purpose. I mean, come on, oftentimes we say things like, you know, but it's newer, it's faster, it's bigger. And I, I would love to take a blind vote as to how many of us have a TV that is bigger than 30 inches. Because here's the truth, none of us need a TV. Bigger than 30 inches. I'm not judging you. I got a TV bigger than 30 inches. I'm just saying that we just just jumped into saying, oh, it's bigger. Or for some people, it's 25% off. I can't resist. It's a sale. I mean, it's, I'm actually buying two of these. I've just saved 100 euro. Because someone put a sticker on it and said, 100 euro off. I've saved 100 euro. Dave Ramsey says no. Oh, it's, 
It's, ro- it's romantic. I mean, we used to have this fire, and that fire has gone out. Which I go, re- re- rekindle the fire. It's not, you know what I'm saying, it's not hard work. But over here, there's this romance. I just feel so drawn to have this desire. I, get, I feel accepted. I, ha- I get attention. It gives me a real sense of adventure. All these things with strong emotional feel. Again, these things aren't bad, but we realize through experiences that they're just not a- enough. And eventually we jump into these things, make decisions, but they take us to a place where we kind of realize, man, how did I end up here? I should have seen this coming. Strong emotional appeal uh, literally causes us to have a confirmation bias. You know what that is? A confirmation bias is, again, something happens with product placement where you convince yourself that something is real or true. You with me? Like you see something, you like it, you don't think about it again, you see it again. Then you start talking to yourself. Like, you really need this. I mean, this would really... Ra- rev- if I had this thing in my life, then this and this and this and this. And you, you, you basically have this discourse in your mind where you always win. And then you start to convince other people around you. And you're kind of going, well, I'm not sure if you spend that much money. Do you really think that's, that it's that important? Is it that? I mean, it's okay if it's kind of thing, but are you willing to go into that much debt for that? And what happens is, is in actual fact, we end up becoming stupid. Confirmation bias makes us stupid. Do you know why I know that? Because when you made a bad decision, when you spent money on something you shouldn't have spent money on, what's the first thing you say? I was so... You said it, not me. I was so stupid. How could I have been so stupid? We, we lower our defenses and we raise our defensiveness. We lower our defenses and we raise our defensiveness. Offensiveness. We're not careful. Strong emotional appeal can cut us off from the voices and the advice and the experience and the perspective of those who don't want anything from us but want the best for us. The challenge, as we think about the principle of the path, is that if you're distracted by what's on the path, watch this, then you'll be distracted from where the path is taking you. And weeks will go by and months, and years, and key relationships will be lost, and regret after regret after regret will be stored up. And hopefully at one point you'll come to your senses and realize, how did I ever end up here? And invariably, either you or someone else say, well, you should, come on, have seen that coming. If you're distracted by what's on the path, then every time you will opt for what's appealing over what's satisfying. And last week we talked about the difference between what's appealing and what's satisfying. Not that it's wrong, but we want something that will last. We want to be in a marriage that's not appealing, but satisfying. It can be appealing, and most relationships start that way. That's a good thing. I mean, come on. You know what I'm saying? Light up that fire, put on that lipstick, buy the flower, love it. But if that's all it's built on, it won't last. Deep down in our hearts, what we want is we want something that brings us a sense of, of satisfaction. Now, uh, again, you know, as we've seen every single week, the scripture speaks to this. And in Galatians chapter 5, our text for today, we're going to read a few verses, verse 13 and 23. We won't read all of them, but we'll pick out a few. What we're going to see is that actually the Apostle Paul, God inspired Apostle Paul to write about this very subject matter, about the tension, the battle of strong emotional appeal that within us, we, what we really long for is to live a life of meaning and satisfaction, of hope and health to live our extraordinary purpose, to be in a path that leads us to our destination. But all of us, not just anybody, we have these, 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 uh, these appeals, these desires, these wants that, that have this strong emotional appeal. If we're not careful, what begins as a diversion can end up becoming a new direction, which ultimately leads to an unintended destination. And so in verse 13, we pick up as the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Galatia, a church just like ours. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, watch this, you were called to be free. One of my favorite verses. Why? Because before I became a Christ follower, when I was a skeptic and I was agnostic and I was, you know, atheistic in my, in my worldview. And so to me, Christians were boring people. Christians were, people were uptight. They... they they were, they were absolutely not free. I was the free one. I could do what I wanted morally. I could do what I wanted spiritually, relationally. I had no boundaries. I thought that was freedom. 
How amazing is that? It's the, the exact opposite is true. God hasn't called us into some restrictive religious practice. No, God has called us, all of us who are Christ followers, to be free. Now, if your version of Christianity isn't liberating, then maybe you have the wrong version. If your version of Christianity is judgmental and legalistic and condemning and restrictive, I'm not sure you can keep the Christ in that Christianity. Because Christ was not judging, not condemning, not, not uh, legalistic. No, he was full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. He spoke the truth, but he was full of grace. And whether it was a woman at a well, whether it was a, a tax collector, whether it was a, a religious leader who was hypocritical, whoever came to him, he showed them love and grace and acceptance and taught them the way of liberty, the way of freedom. And some of us today, we need to, we need to recheck our theology and ask the question, are we living a Christianity that calls for freedom or are we simply settling for uh, a made in China second best version, which really is, is nothing more than a, 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 a counterfeit which binds people up in bondage. I mean, I don't, I don't know about you, but one of the most frustrating groups of people to meet in the world are people who say they're Christians, but don't act, look, or sound anything like Christ. I have no problem dealing with someone who says, I have no appreciation for Jesus, no respect, I'm going to do my thing. Well, at least I can understand where you're coming from. But when you say, I'm a Christ follower, I have, I have surrendered my life to Christ. Last week, the whole mesh, I'm following Jesus. But, but you live a different lifestyle to what you're saying. That just confused. Not that we can't screw up. I mean, hey, I, we all make mistakes. You with me here? But to live a, a habitual lifestyle that's out of sync, that's in a different direction, which ultimately, watch this, is leading to a different destination. I think, I think we've got a problem with that. We've been called to be free. Now, he continues in verse 13. However, we should not use that freedom to indulge Here's a technical biblical word in the flesh. The flesh is kind of, uh, you know, this idea that, that we have a body uh, and our body, if you want to call it, is, is broken. You know, God created Adam and Eve in the beginning in, in, in Genesis perfectly. We made some choices. The consequence of that choice is that very often, even though if we put our faith in Christ, we have a spirit that wants to do God's will, our body constantly has a default mode to the wrong thing. And so we, we, have, we have called to be free, but we shouldn't use that freedom to indulge our flesh. In other words, what the Apostle Paul is saying is that we shouldn't say yes to every impulse. We shouldn't give in just because something's appealing. But you haven't seen it. But you haven't tasted it. But you haven't met her. If you only saw where he worked, if you can understand what he said, if you, only, if you could only appreciate how appealing this is, then you'd understand, no, I wouldn't. Because sometimes strong emotional appeal can lead to very poor decisions. Don't say yes to every impulse. Why? Because in saying yes to every impulse, here, here's the lie of our culture. Christians are all bound. We're all free. You know, God says, no, the opposite is true. Christians are free, and those who are not of Christ are bound. But what have we learned from our experience? Pause theology for a second, and let's talk about our experience. All of us, in our own way, shape, or form, have lived life or tried to live life without God. And every single time the world dangles a car of freedom, very often the price of that momentary freedom, that one night stand, that one hit of a drug, that one drink, that one jumping in the car leads us to a place of bondage. A place where we never thought we'd end up in prison. We never thought we'd end up in addiction. We never thought we'd end up with this person at the expense of that person. We never thought that we would be here, but saying yes to every single impulse, indulging the flesh is actually destructive for us. Why? Because it costs us our freedom and it very often hurts those we care about in the process. Am I speaking to anyone in this place this morning? Or am I up here by myself? Because I kind of feel this is real. And this is impactful. And I kind of feel like God loves us and wants us to start making a new set of, uh, to make some new decisions that help us to make a new set of decisions that lead us in a new direction. How, where we've come from, our past is our past. And there's grace for that. God has called us to freedom. 
And as we put our trust in Jesus, he has paid the price for that past. However, our future is our future. We can't change what happened to us or what, what happened through us, but we can determine today is what's going to happen as a result of our choices. See, Apostle Paul says this gospel message is a message of freedom. However, don't use that freedom to indulge the fl- in flesh. First thing, rather, here's how you use your freedom. Rather, use that freedom to serve one another humbly in love. In other words, what he's saying is that we should leverage the freedom that we've been given, not just for our benefit, but more importantly, for the benefit of others. Why? Because when we begin to understand that true satisfaction in life is not me getting what I want, but me helping other people get what they want, then not only will their lives become more satisfying, because they're getting what they desire, they want, but our lives become satisfying. Because in the process of giving away, we receive. And the Apostle Paul is saying that we have been given freedom, but the true experience of this freedom is that when we use our freedom, watch this, and give away our freedom to help other people become more free. Is that making sense? And so what, what that sets us up to do is it, re, it resets the destination compass in our GPS so that we end up in a more satisfying, maybe not appealing. I mean, it's not necessarily appealing to serve other people. It's not necessarily more appealing to be humble. It's not necessarily more appealing to put others first. But every single time, I can guarantee you it is satisfying to know that I am making a difference. I continue in verse 14. For the entire law, the law, of course, if you don't know, is the Old Testament. It's a summarized uh, yeah, summary of all that God had spoken and done uh, to the uh, Israelite people in the Old Testament. And it says the entire law is, is, is uh, fulfilled in keeping this one command. Watch this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, is this Paul's idea? Did he... Uh, um, create this phrase or come to start? No, of course not. He's quoting Jesus. Jesus himself said in the Gospels, the entire law can be summed up in this one phrase, that if you're just willing to love your neighbor as you love yourself, and of course, let's not misinterpret what has been said here, that we should become doormats or we should become ragdolls or we, we don't matter. Hey, first we've got to value ourselves, right? And as we value ourselves and to the degree which we value ourselves, we begin to value others. In other words, What's not good enough for me is not good enough for you. What's not good enough for me is not good, good enough for that person. It's kind of like, uh, you know, recently I was making um, a sandwich uh, for, for my boys. Every, I, I do the kind of lunch thing and uh, making a sandwich. And, you know, I was putting in, uh, I was kind of concerned they weren't really finish their sandwich. And like I said earlier on, I don't like waste. You know what I'm saying? If I see crusts in that, in that uh, see-through uh, lunch packet afterwards they're going to eat at home you know what I'm saying you better eat your lunch <laughs> and uh, and so I was kind of thinking man they're not eating all this so I'm going to put less ham in their sandwich because I don't think they're finishing it and as I was going through this mental process of you know that's acceptable uh, because of the resource front and the stewardship front God zapped me and said hey if you opened your sandwich today and work you had one piece of ham how would you feel I'd be thinking what mangy fella honest to goodness what greedy, f- who, who would be so low to only give me? I mean, when I, when I eat my sandwich, I don't know about you, but I want to have two or three, you know what I'm saying, slices of meat in that sandwich. Is anyone with me? Two or three, I, I want to feel, I want to, I, I, it should take at least a second to bite through that thing. If I'm looking for my meat and my sandwich, something clearly, catastrophically has gone wrong. And so I felt God say, hey, you made them, they're in your image and likeness, they're going to be hungry, give them an extra slab of ham. And so I've been doing that. And the point is, again, it's, it's funny, it's true, but it, it's an example of how so often we can, we can say, well, that person should get this, but actually I, I'm going to be different. No, to love your neighbor as yourself is to say, what's good enough for me is good enough for them. Why, am I, why, why is the best good for me and second best, best for them? Literally, when Jesus was teaching this in the New Testament, what he was trying to get us to see that if it's not good enough for them, then not only is it not good enough, but in actual fact, it's a sin. If we do things, say things that affect people in a way that is not good for them, then it, it, can, it can slip into the realm of being sinful. Why? Because it's harming them. It's not loving them. What is sin? Sin is nothing more than, than living outside God's will for our lives, right? Sin isn't always this horrible, dark thing. Sin is just 
not doing what God wants us to do for our benefit. And so if God calls us to love people as ourselves and we're not doing that, then it's not just not doing it. It's actually we are living in a place of sin. Maybe you never thought about it before. But God has no standard of sin. Sin is sin. You know, we have standards of one sin's worse than the other, but God, sin is sin. If it's not good enough for them, if it infringes on their freedom, if it costs them, if it hurts them, if it takes them away from God, well then, that's not good. I suppose what the Apostle Paul is getting at in terms of the freedom part is that if what I'm doing infringes on their freedom, and watch this, then I won't use my freedom at an expense of theirs. I will be more free by making the choice to not use my freedom. See, those who are free, who, those who are not free think they're free because they live a life that looks free, but they can't say no. And when you can't say no to that drink, when you can't say no to that group of friends, when you can't say no to going to that place, when you can't say no to that habit, when you can't say no to that addiction, you are no longer free. Yes. True freedom is saying, I can, but I won't. Yes. I can, because I am free, yes. but you know what? I won't. It could be something as trivial as, that muffin looks really appealing. But one of my goals was to lose some weight. I can, but I won't. Oh, look at you, uptight, not eating the muffin, da 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 No, 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 you can't say no. You're not free. I can, and I say no. But here's the thing. You get to a day where you'll be so overweight and so unhappy, every time you eat the muffin, the joy will be robbed because you'll feel guilty. But I, on the other hand, Mm. it's time to say yes to this muffin. Are you with me? True freedom is not saying yes to everything. True freedom, in actual fact, is knowing when to say no. So what should we do? How do we, how do we live? How do we love our neighbor by ourselves? Well, he continues in verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit. Love this. Walk by the Spirit. What he's saying is that we don't live this life alone. God walks with us through the person of his Holy Spirit. I'm walking by the Spirit. Literally, the image in in the Greek language is like keeping in step. You know, like kind of like if you've you've got a spouse or one day you will or a girlfriend, boyfriend, you're holding hands. You're you're walking in step. You're staying the same rhythm. One's not dragging the other or getting lost or going different directions. You're heading in the same direction at the same pace. How we do this is is we walk with the Spirit. Literally speaking... God gives us, and you know this to be true, these internal nudgings. These internal leadings. Here's the amazing thing. If you're here, you're not a Christ follower, or you are, is that all of us experience these internal nudges. Call it conscience. Call it a moral compass. I'll just call it for who he is, the Holy Spirit. Hello? The Holy Spirit working in you nudging you and what's so interesting if you've noticed is that this internal nudging always is nudging you to do the right thing and to put others first you know what i'm talking about you get to the door and there's someone behind you something says let that person go first where does that come from you're standing at the counter and and someone's got their hands full of looking in rushes and you sometimes you let them go first you're standing in suit value and there's someone beside you and, and someone just says you should you should pay for their their lunch. Whose idea is that? <laughs> Pay for your own damn lunch. Where does that come from? How does that have any evolutionary bias or benefit? None. But something in us nudges us. That person first. Do the right thing. Don't go down that path. Where does that come from? It's the Holy Spirit. In fact, what we've been doing, and today actually marks the end of 21 days of push. 21 days been praying and fasting as a church to understanding the stories have been incredible today is the end of 21 days of prayer and fasting and and really what we've been doing in those 21 days in our in our reading plan our soaping is god i want to feel more of those nudges like it's good to kind of feel every now and again but i want to have the sense when i'm in the car in the morning heading down the m3 that that you're with me and as i'm thinking about things in life that as I'm rattling these things in my brain, there's like a nudge. It's truth. You're speaking to me. You're helping me. That you're guiding me. That when I'm making key decisions, 
when I'm unsure about how to react to something. When someone at work really pushes buttons, I need to go to the bathroom and calm down, that you just nudge me to react in the right way. Like, we want more. We want to walk in better step with the Spirit. Why? Because we've learned, haven't we, that life with God always works out better. Because life with God isn't necessarily the most appealing life, but it is definitely the most satisfying. Paul says, if you walk with the Spirit, and you will not, if I walk with you, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Better translations might be, you will not fulfill your selfish desires. In other words, you will not give in to strong emotional appeal. Walk in the Spirit, be satisfied, feel these nudges, and that's how you will not give in to every single thing that comes your way. You won't be susceptible to these things when they come. For in verse 17, the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Have you ever noticed, by the way, that tension, tension between what you ought to and what you want to? And again, if you're here today and you're not a Christ follower, you, you need to figure out a theology of this. You, you need to figure out what you believe in because, because I believe right here in Scripture we have the answer that we have in us a flesh and a spirit of God, and they're in conflict you know, what I ought to do because it's right and it's noble and it's, it's beneficial for other people and ultimately it will bring me satisfaction and what I want and what I want now. And so often those things are in conflict. It's not that the things we want are bad. Maybe it's the fact that we want them now or the way we want them that leads to a path, an ultimate destination. And again, if you're not here and you're, you're skeptic or you're searching, where does that come from? And again, if we're all just here by, because of evolution, why would, why, what, what purpose could that serve? There's no purpose for that. But here in Scripture, we see an, an explanation of internal truth that we have a compass that's designed, that's designed to bring us home. And this conflict, we're told, uh, rages in every single one of us. In verse 17, it continues. There are conflict with each other so that you do not do whatever you want. You know, you, we, we all want, don't we, ultimately what's appealing. We want the TV. We want the newer, the bigger, the faster. And again, that's not necessarily wrong. It's when we act on that want prematurely when we give in to that desire without counting the cost that very often it leads to a road of regret. And we've all learned, like I said already, these things, although in the moment are really appealing, and it can even be uh, enjoyable, ultimately can lead us to a place where we lack satisfaction. You know, Mick Jagger said it, I believe he's a prophet. I can't get no satisfaction. But I tried, and boy did he try. But if he's a man with all the wealth and riches and fame and glory and girth, the whole thing, and he can't find no satisfaction by indulging the flesh, tell me who can. Here's the thing. Strong emotional appeal is a red, red light, not a green flag. Just because we really want something, really like something, should, that shouldn't be the thing that gives us permission to go do it. It should be, wow, time out, hold on. I really, really, really want this. That should be an indicator because of wisdom and perspective. Actually, you know what? We need to step back from this. I am absolutely burning up right now. It's getting hot in here. Oop. Thanks, guys. That we just give in to that. No, we shouldn't. We should, the, the, the more appealing something is, the, the, more, the more strongly it pulls on our soul, the more careful we should be. Right? The hotter the fire, the more careful we should be. Apostle Paul continue, continues. He says, but if you are led by the Spirit, in other words, if you will give in to those nudges, if you will learn to listen for, if you learn to trust those nudges, if you're willing to reign in your freedom for the sake of others, now something changes. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Why? Because Jesus came to set us free from the penalty of the law. If Jesus came uh, to fulfill the Old Testament, Whereas in the Old Testament, we had to work to earn our salvation, earn our freedom. Not anymore. We put our hope and our trust in Jesus. And we're told that all of our past mistakes and all of our past regrets and all of our past brokenness, he will take upon himself so that we can be free. So we get to choose, watch this, a new path. He takes our past so we can, cho so we can choose a new path. We were on a path leading to death and destruction, a path to try to take us out. God took us from that path and said, here, you get to start again. You get to start afresh. You get to press the reset button. And if we, if we, if we allow ourselves, we give ourselves to be led by the Spirit, 
ultimately what he's saying is that instinctively, as Christ followers, we will know what to do. It's almost like God will instinctively lead us as to how we should respond. Either in the moment or after the moment, we'll feel like, oh, you know what? I did not deal with that very well. You ever had that feeling before? Like you and your wife have a conversation or something and you overreact. Your defense is lower. Your defensiveness goes higher. And the conversation ends and you go, that's not how I plan that. I mean, I, I, this is, it was only a conversation about whether or not we better have broccoli or carrots. I mean, how do we end up arguing about this? You know what I'm saying? And it's almost like God will, will lead us to a place of learning. Why? Because if you want to have a satisfying marriage, you can't be arguing over broccoli and carrots. <laughs> is, this, is this just common sense? Not, not really tough stuff. The question we should ask in every circumstance, the question the Spirit asks of us in every circumstance, and maybe you've never put language on this, but I want to give you language there because I think it will really help you, is simply this. What does love require of me? In this moment, with this person, in this case, what does love require from me? We understand that if it's not good for him, it's a sin. If it's not good for her, I'll defer. If, if my choice affects them in a negative way, I'm not loving them as my neighbor. If I react to my boss or my spouse or a person, if I betray trust or confidence, if I, if I, if I um, don't align my life, like I said at the beginning, to, pe- to, to what you know, God requires, then all of a sudden something's out of sync, something's out of whack. And the simple question to ask is, in this scenario, what does love require of me? I mean, I just think that for both our churches now in Dublin, if all of us left this place there and simply every day asked ourselves the question, right now, Lord, what does your love require of me? I think there'd be a revolution. I don't think, I don't think, they think the world would know what to do with us. Who are all these crazy people deferring their freedom for the sake of others because of love? A love they say they found in Jesus. That makes no sense. Can you imagine how different your life would be if every single day and every decision you asked the question, Lord, not what's, not what's emotionally appealing right now, as strong and as loud as it is, but what is your Holy Spirit saying? Where are you nudging me? How can I love better? How can I serve better? How can I use this freedom? Maybe here to say no, so that over here I can say yes. Now, Apostle Paul goes on and says there's, you know, these acts of the flesh are, are, are obvious. He lists a whole bunch in verse 19, which again, in case you're wondering, if you want to read it later on, this is not a judgment for those outside the church. We're not called to judge those outside the church. In Corinthians, Paul says we should not judge anybody outside the church, okay? It's not my business as to what your business is if you're not a Christian. And none of us as Christians should judge anyone else outside the church. You with me here? But what it is, is it's the expression of Christian faith for those inside the church. It's so easy to go, that. It's so hard to go. And so he lists uh, the results of indulging in the flesh. And what you'll notice is that they have strong emotional appeal. Verse 21, he says, I warn you, as, before, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he basically challenges them to, to live in a different direction. He says, hey, you need to rethink the path you're going on because even though you have these, all these good intentions, if you keep going in this direction, it, it will lead you to this destination. It continues in verse 22 saying the fruit of the Spirit is love. And what's so interesting is that love is singular. So the fruit of the Spirit is one fruit. It's love. And from love comes joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, and of course, self-control. You know, if you're here today and you're thinking, I don't know what kind of person I should marry or what kind of, what, you know, I should, I should you know, go out with. Um, find a person with the fruit of the Spirit. Because you want to marry someone who's full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. You, you, you want to work for that person. You want to hang around with that person. I mean, you want to you follow that person. Maybe you want to become that person. That's the kind of person that really brings change to the world. This is the fruit that the Spirit can produce in all of us, the fruit of love. He finishes off in verse 23. So that against such things there is no law. In other words, when we live according to the Spirit, there is no regret. There is no condemnation. There's no looking over your shoulder and wondering. Will anyone find out? When you live according to the eternal nudges of the Holy Spirit, when you love your neighbor, when you understand that you are free to do all things, but also free to do some things. And true freedom is knowing the difference. When you live your life that isn't just about yourself and for yourself, but leveraging and helping other people, 
And there's no law, no regret, no looking over your shoulder. And I want to challenge today as we close up this message that the best way that you and I can predict our future is by paying attention to the way we're headed. I want to ask you, what way are you headed? Are you headed in a way that is characterized by the nudgings of the Spirit, producing the fruit of love, peace, patience, joy, all those things? Or are you living in a way that is dodging in the flesh? And as you read those two categories, you see yourself more in the, in the category of, of the flesh. Because you may think I have all these attentions, but in, it's your direction, not your intention, that determines your destination. I'm going to invite Tara to come on up here now. And the band will come shortly. I want to challenge you to really think about this. Because these have painful circles. I, I learned this. Let me give you a story, and then I'll give you a question, we're going to pray. I learned this the hard way many years ago. <clears throat> you know, I just got married, and uh, Joshua was just born, and I was driving an absolute banger of a car. Anyone ever drive a banger of a car? Come on. And uh, I won't tell you what it was in case you're still driving it. And uh, it was a banger of a car. This, this car was a banger that I used to get up in the morning and, and go to work, and, and literally every morning, even in summer, I had to jump start this car. No matter how many times I changed the battery, it just needed to jump start this car. There were times where, honest to goodness, I thought that the wheels might fall off this car. In fact, one time, the entire like, um, exhaust pipe it just fell off the car. I was driving along, and the car the exhaust just fell off. The other time I was driving along, I was trying to cut across the road like this, you know what I'm saying, like this way, and the car switched off. Not just the power, the, the, the power steering, the brakes, there was a truck coming out, I was always killed, honestly. It was fine. So we decided the responsibility to do was to get a new car. So we saved money. We had a couple of thousand euro in cash that we'd saved sacrificially to go buy a car. I knew the car I wanted. I had a picture of my destination. It was, it was a safe car. It had won awards. It was a good brand. It was a good price. It was affordable. It was secondhand. It was, it was maybe that time, maybe 10 plus years old. But it was, it, was, it was a destin. It was where I wanted to be, yeah? So I go to the Renault dealership uh, back home in Carlo. And I'm um, looking at this car, and I'm very happy. There's two of the same price. I'm trying to decide which one. And the salesman goes, well, what about this one? This other car, a car I'd never seen, a car I'd never noticed on the road, a car that had never really appealed to me. But when I saw this car, it was beautiful. It was like a dark, I'll never forget, the color was midnight blue. I got in it, black, comfy seats, all these gadgets, technology. There was no key. There was a card, which, you know, a long time ago, that was a really cool thing. He said, take it for a test drive. Worst thing I ever... Never take it for a test drive. If you can't afford it, look at it, give glory to God for it, and move on. Don't drive that car. I drove the car. I loved the car. It was wonderful. Uh, how it was with me. Got into the dealership. He's looking at me going... We're going to have a conversation soon where I'm going to say, you should have seen. It's coming. I just, I just, I, I lowered my defenses and I raised my defense. No, 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 you don't understand. So I said to the guy, how am I going to do this? He goes, well, even though you don't have, this, have the money, there's a company who'd love to help you with a service called Higher Purchase. Who are these people? Why do they love me so much? Why would they be so nice? You can drive away with this car tomorrow I'm like this is this is this is from heaven it's miraculous all it took was 30 seconds to put my name along the dotted line I didn't realize because I thought I was free that in my freedom to choose everything by choosing everything I became a captive four months later we were asked myself and Lud because at the time I could afford it I had a great job she had a great job we were asked to give all the up and move to Navin and become pastors of a church which meant a considerable decrease in pay which meant we couldn't make the repayments for the car and for about three years every single day I was getting phone calls because I was paying interest on interest so I couldn't make these payments it was literally killing me the pressure but you know what I'm talking about come on some of you have been there some of you are there I just kept saying, what an idiot. How stupid. I should have seen that coming. Why didn't I listen? I blame this person and that person and the other person. It's not my fault. I'm a victim. And it was sore. We couldn't, we couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't do anything. 
literally living in, 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 in fear that one day they're going to shut my house and take my car and I would be carless. And here am I supposed to be pastoring a church? Just one thing with strong emotional appeal. And if you're there today, let me encourage you that God is good and He is faithful and, and He can help you. And the story goes that years later, uh, God challenged me actually at the beginning of a year to increase my giving to the church. I, went, I can't afford to give more money to this church. We already given everything. And God said, what you gave yesterday doesn't count. I'm asking you to give anew. He challenged me personally. So I said, okay, Lord. To have a little talk, we prayed. We said, we're going to do this. And we did. And a little while went by. I got a phone call and someone said, hey, we just sold our house. And we're praying. Watch this. They're using their freedom. They kind of went, oh, it's all ours. But they prayed first to God, no, it's yours. What do you want us to do? And so they prayed and God said, I want you to ring up Jamie Corker and pay off his car loan. This person remembered, it's a bit awkward. I don't even know, do you have a car loan? I mean, am I just assuming something here? And I was like, what do you mean? So God told us, how much is the car loan? I told him how much it was. It was a lot of money. And uh, and I said, okay, we'll pay it. I said, no, no, it wasn't 800. It was 8,000. I said, yeah, we'll pay it. God has told us to use our freedom, not to leverage our own benefit, to leverage yours, so you can be free. How good is God? So I want to encourage you, find yourself in that place today. Don't give up. God will make a way. But here's my question. Here's the learning from the story. My question is, have you ever become so enamored with something or someone on the path that you fail to recognize where your path is taking you? Have you lowered your defenses and raised your defensiveness? I want to challenge you this, this month, this January, this year. Let's start living in a different direction. Maybe you ask yourself, is there a way back? Yes, there is the way back. And the way back is the way forward. It's the principle of the path. Direction, not intention, determines your destination. You want to live in a different destination, start living according to a new direction. Maybe today that means for you, you're not a Christ follower, give your life to Christ. I want to live in this new direction where I'm going to start trusting Jesus. Maybe you're here and you're not part of a connect group or haven't been or were and didn't work so well and now you're not anymore. Join a connect group. Get into community. Have, make some friends, belong. Maybe you're here and you haven't been honoring God financially. Hey, make a decision at the beginning of the year. God, I'm going to give. I'm going to test this thing. I'm going to, I'm going to for the next 11 months, honor you faithfully to tithe and see what happens. Maybe you've been wondering about something else. I don't know what it is for you. I just want to encourage you. I want to see you so much living in the destination that God's called you to live. But the principle of the path is a principle. What you sow, you reap. If you like it or not, it's going, to, it's going to stick to you and apply itself to you. Hey, let's start living in a new direction. Let's start thinking about where is God coming to be? God's called to be free and make some choice to do that. And I just believe, I just trust for you and for your family and for your future that testimonies may not happen. I may not hear the testimony of your life next week or next month, but maybe a year from now or five years from now or 10 years from now, you look back and say, thank God I chose this direction because it's brought me to this destination. Amen? Amen. So on that note, I want to invite you to stand. I'm going to pray for you. Worship team going to come back. And again, we have a couple of response areas. The cross over here to my right, the communion table to my left. There'll be a prayer team at the back if you want prayer. Maybe you stand and worship. I, I want to simply ask you, what has God been saying to you through this message? And what is your next step? Because the next step is the first step in a new direction. Are you with me? So I know that the, the first week of January is over, but the whole month of January is really a, a, a year of new resolutions. And I want to encourage you, make your 2019 resolution to walk in the right direction so you're working towards the right destination. Amen? Let's bow our heads and pray. So Father, I thank you that you love us enough to challenge us with things that sometimes stretch us, uh, sometimes provoke us, sometimes make us feel uncomfortable. Thank you you love us. Thank you you love us enough to sometimes make us uncomfortable. Because when we're comfortable, we don't ask the right questions. We take certain things for granted. But when you shake up our world, all of a sudden we begin searching and asking. And asking the kind of questions that lead to the right directions. 
Father, I thank you that every single person here is on a journey and you have a plan and purpose for their life. And no matter what they're going through, no matter what they've gone through, you are with them, Lord. May they, may they sense that today. May they feel and sense your nudgings. And I would pray, Lord, with all my brothers and sisters, Lord, what is your next step for me? What should, what should, what should I do? What should we do, Lord? As a result of these messages, what is, what is my next step? What is our next step? And today as we respond in this song, as we maybe go to the cross, as we break bread as family or friends, maybe we go to a prayer team, I just pray today that we would know, that we would feel that nudge and know what our next step is. And that God, six weeks from now and six months from now and a year from now and six years from now, we would hear stories, testimonies from people all over this place who because of decisions made today, greatly and drastically affected their lives by choosing a direction that determined a new destination. We thank you, Lord, for this. And we're not alone in this. And you are good to us in this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.